Hello and good afternoon. Uh, this is Mike Rose with CoStar Video. I want to welcome everyone today for attending our uh, webinar. We've got a few things to cover. We've got a few people still logging on here, but we're going to go ahead and get started on uh, just the introduction portion of this meeting. Um, for those of you that are on the call, you may notice that you are muted just because of the uh, background noise factor. I've got uh, everyone muted. So the way we will communicate during this call will be through the questions uh, section. You should have a toolbar on your GoToWebinar uh, pop-up. Uh, under the questions, you'll be able to be a box there where you can type in a question that will come directly back to me. If that is a question that it, I can answer right then, I'll go ahead and address it. If it's something that's going to be handled further on during the call, then I will defer it till then. But when, before we get started, just so that I know you are communicating and able to hear me, if you'll just do me a favor and type in the name of the city from which you are calling from in that box, send it, and then that will let me know that uh, the communication is good and that we are, we are talking. So in that questions box, just give me the name of the city that you're calling from. All right, perfect, coming across, excellent. Okay, great, and again, my name is Mike Rose. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for CoStar. This is my 10th year with the company, so I've been here quite a while. I've seen a lot of technologies come and go through the years, and this one right here is a very exciting technology. Um, it has been around for a while, but the way that it's deployed and works within the CoStar platform is, is unique in the fact that it's incredibly easy to use. It's just almost like adding a fixed camera and being able to view it, use it as a tool. It's uh, just very, very easy. So we're going to go through that during this presentation. I'm going to try to keep this as concise as possible. I'm going to break this up into three parts. The first part, we're going to look at the technologies themselves. Then we're going to look at the a, a test drive of the product in, a, in an actual environment, and then we're going to talk about some applications and how it's configured into a system. So the the actual po topic points that we're going to cover are going to be as follows: you know, why the 360 camera, and what advantages do they offer? We're going to talk about the magic behind the 360 camera. So why it is so unique, and why people are really using the cameras. Then we're going to talk about resolution. We're going to dive into resolution so that you have a good idea of just exactly what to expect when you deploy one of these cameras. So a lot of users, end users, get the impression that now they can have one camera only and it's going to cover everything they need to cover. So we're going to be able to frame in those expectations. We are also going to talk about the two types of technology or methods that people utilize for 360 cameras. <clears throat> then we're going to do the test drive like we talked about earlier. We're actually going to look at it in a couple real world scenarios. Uh, we're going to look out in our warehouse. We're going to look at our demo room. and We're going to drive this thing. And then the installation layout. How does this deploy into an INX system? What is it? What's the parameters? And we're actually going to spread one out on a paper and look how it attaches. <clears throat> So with that being said, let's get started here and why 360 cameras? Why are they so popular and why are people really intrigued with these things? And I think if you boil it down to the lowest common denominator, it is the fact that you have a situational awareness that you don't get with fixed cameras. In this example, if I were watching a forklift or a person walk around in this warehouse environment, <clears throat> I would be tracking that person in their entirety. So as I watch them walk through these racks around this table, pick something up and then walk back through this door, where unlike a traditional screen where I may have to use four cameras to cover this area, as a loss prevention expert, I may be sitting here trying to figure out that this person walked out this area, then they appeared on this camera as they walked across and then they popped out over here and they walked in that door. So 
I've got three separate views <clears throat> that I'm trying to piece together. In an operation where you're watching forklift traffic and directions of people moving, these cameras do a phenomenal job at that coverage. So that is the, the underlying factor, I think, that's really driving a lot of these. And then the fact that they offer the 100% coverage, that they're solid state, there's no moving parts, so no longer you have to worry about motors and uh, focus cycles, things like that. And unlike a PTZ, this records 100% coverage all the time. When I change my view or zoom into an area, I'm not losing anything. I'm not losing any detail because everything behind me is still being recorded. So when a regular PTZ, when I'm using my optical zoom to zoom in and out, that's where I lose whatever is not on the screen for my recording. <clears throat> the definitions on these things are becoming greater and greater. They're no longer two megapixels. They're five and sometimes greater. We work with a five megapixel uh, imager so that we are using five megapixels in this product. And then with fewer cameras, just like we looked at that area of the warehouse, that one camera was able to cover for the areas that we wanted to see, well, that's a easier insulation perhaps and maybe fewer cameras. So there are cost savings that are possibly bound up into that. So with all those things, the magic behind the 360 is not the fact that I can fish eye an image and cover a vast area. It's the de-warping aspect of that image. So looking at the image and looking at multiple images from this one image. So I'm no longer just looking at this round donut or warped image. It's the fact that I can take I can take this image and de-warp it and flatten this thing out. So the tools that allow me to do that, we're going to explore those in great detail here in just a second. We're going to look at the resolution chart real quick, just kind of put the ranges in perspective on what to expect and then <clears throat> we'll go into the de-warping. So I want to introduce everyone to this. It's called Dory. It's a pixels per foot calculation. That is the official EN code for this. It is a it is used in security standards specifications will sometimes refer to this. But this right here is used industry wide and it stands for detect, observe, recognize, and identify. And for those of you that are familiar with pixels per foot calculations, this, this will make a lot of sense for you, and this will break it down to what to expect. Basically, what this rule states is that for these areas, I have detect, I need eight pixels per square foot in order to consider this a detection. A detection would be just being able to see movement and trigger some type of uh, a Maybe it's an alarm or just bring you your attention to the fact that someone is in the area. Then to observe, I need 19 pixels per foot to recognize, to be able to see. As you can see the, the, at the bottom down here, I've broken this out, where I'm looking at under detect. I see there's a person there. I can't tell who that person is, but I have detected that there is a person in that area. Observe with my 19 pixels. That's about what to expect. It's still, I'm looking at maybe what they're doing. I can see if they maybe pick something up, but I still can't tell who they are. Recognize, I can. I can tell you that's Joe Smith, and I'm using about 38 pixels per square foot per foot in order to recognize that. And then finally, identify, which is the expectations that most people have with cameras at hundreds and hundreds of feet, as we all know, that's not the case. Identify in being able to see the license plate, being able to see the person, make out their characteristics, and 100% identify that person. That is the detection ring. So when you're using, and this does not only hold true for IP cameras or 360 cameras, this is for, for all cameras in, in these ranges. Now, for a 360 camera, here is it in a graphical form. If I have a camera deployed, I have this example set at 10 foot from the finished floor. So the camera is in the ceiling, 10 foot from the floor. 
I have a ring around that camera that's going to give me those 30 or 67 pixels, 76, sorry, 76 pixels per square foot in this 14 foot by 14 foot circle. Then it goes out to at 15 foot away from center. I'm able to still recognize, observe, and then detect. When you get into observe and detect, that's where your digital zoom really is, is not much use to you because the pixels are so spread out at that, at that distance. Whereas recognize and identify, I am able to zoom in and <clears throat> look at details and, and recognize and identify people. So this graph is, is available to you. Um, it's actually uh, part of this presentation, which is available to anyone on the call, anybody that wants a copy of this. This is also recorded for your viewing pleasure. If you want to have a uh, another look at this after the fact, then just let me know and I can uh, forward you the link to this. So that's what to expect, and that helps keep the expectations into check. So now, talking about the distances, and you can kind of see this will be a good example, and we'll actually test drive this camera in a second. But here is finishing up on the magic behind the 360 is taking those warped images and flattening them out like you see here on the right-hand side. These images are a subset of this red or this round image. So this area that I'm looking at right here is this image flattened out. This area here by the door is that image flattened out. So the software has the ability to go in and flatten these images. Now, in order to do that, there are two methods that are used for, for de-warping images. The first one is allowing the camera to do the de-warping. Now, <clears throat> in this fashion, there's no software required. It's basically sending a feed to the recorder that's already flat. I've used that round image, and I've flattened it out, and I'm sending it. And basically, it's what you see is what you get recording. It's even though the camera has had to warp the image to look at it, what it sends to the recorder is flat. <clears throat> the second method is letting the software do the de-warping, software meaning the client software. So in our case, it's IRAS. IRAS looks at that warped image. That's what it sees, and it gives you the tools within itself to flatten the image. Here's an example of, of that. Camera de-warping. The camera is looking at this image, but it's not sending that image to the recorder. What the recorder sees are these four flat images, already flat. So one, two, three, four are sent. <clears throat> Those images cannot be moved. I can digitally zoom in on them, but I can't take these four images and throw them into a back into a round format and then zoom around that round format. So this is a method that's used, but it's, <clears throat> you know, in my opinion, it's very limited. But it does cut down on camera counts. It does give you four images. does give you 360-degree views. But they're all fixed from one camera. Now, in client de-warping, I have the ability to, to record this round image and make these subsets from it. Now, what this allows me to do is maximize this toolbar. This toolbar gives me a lot of features that I can use on that warped image. So the recorder has recorded that warped image. I now can de-warp it and manipulate it, move it around, and I have a lot of flexibility, both when I record it and view it back, when I put it into a clip, or if I'm just looking at it live. So this toolbar is what allows for this camera to be incredibly easy to use. For an end user, when I throw the 360 camera into their lap and just say, hey, hit this toolbar, here's all the options that you have, and let's just roll through this toolbar real quick. I'll just show you, give you a quick rundown of what to expect on this toolbar. First thing I can do is I can mount this on the wall, the ceiling, or the floor, <clears throat> looking up, out, or down. I just need to tell the camera what the orientation is. I can also lay out 
either just the round image or if I want to do with the tiles beside of it, I have several options underneath that tile setup. I maybe do a one image with four beside of it or six or seven beside. Then I can actually look at this round image in a panoramic fashion. I can stretch that image out where I'm looking at, if it were a clock from midnight to midnight, all the way across. So everything in that 360 degree would just be flattened out. And we'll look at that here in just a second. I can also go in here and highlight an area, select it with my mouse, and zoom right in on it. Select that area and look at it more detail. Then I have a spot finder. So in this case, I'm looking over here at this forklift. If you can see, there's an orange outline that is telling me what I'm looking at. So as I click on each one of these frames, this window will move to give me the orientation of what I'm actually looking at. Then I have a picture-in-picture -picture mode, which will give me a little spot finder right down here that tells me exactly where I'm looking when I'm zoomed into this image. So that's a nice feature. <clears throat> but my favorite by far is the EPTZ. It acts as though I'm floating inside this image. I can drop into it, and then I can zoom around. I can go right, left. It's a virtual PTZ. Then I have an auto pan. It's basically lets each one of those tiles to the right move back and forth, scanning the areas. It's it's a nice feature, but I I question how much it's actually get how much it actually gets used. And there are presets. If I want to go through and say, okay, zoom to the door, zoom to the forklift, zoom to the back door, I can do that and set those presets just like a PTZ. So in the previous setup, when you have the camera dewarping, I don't have all of these tools. And if these tools are available, they're done in a web browser of some type that you have to go into, adds an extra step of complexity for an end user. This is always at their fingertips. <clears throat> So with that being said, I'm going to set up the test drive here. We're actually going to go inside and look at this in action. Give me one second here while I pull up <clears throat> the IRAS. So for those of you that are new to CoStar, you are looking at IRAS. And this is our flagship VMS. As you know, it's a, it's a license-free software, no recurring license fees. Very easy, very flexible. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to be using the live tab today, and I'm going to go in and let's look at this demo site right here, XDI demo site. And we are going to look first at the demo room. So I'm looking through, here's my wall. do this. I'm going to go ahead and just pull the whole recorder over, look at it, and then I'll zoom into the one I want. Okay, it's this one right here. All right. We are looking at our demo room. Now, this is higher than 10 foot off the floor. This is, we're probably closer to 12 to 14 foot. This is a really tall room. But this is a probably a 24 by 36 training room. And I am looking at every aspect of this room. Nothing can happen in this room without me seeing it. Now, as we talked about earlier, right down here in the lower right-hand corner, I have a toolbar. I'm just going to turn on my fisheye. And here are all of the tools that I have available to me. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm going to do is the I'm going to put this into a tile layout. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to pick the six with a main. That's the view that we were looking at um, on the presentation. So I have my warp, my recorded image, and then here are all my de-warped. If I click on this, I'm going to turn my viewfinder on. So here's this image. I'm looking at that wall. If I want to zoom in to that wall, I can do it, and I can back back out, and you'll notice that my viewfinder just follows suit. Each one of these, it tells me the area that I'm covering. And I can zoom in, and I can zoom back out. So I'm closer and further away just by using the, I'm using the roller ball on my mouse. That's it. <clears throat> okay, I'm also, I'm going to turn this back off. I'm going to turn this off, and I'll go back to my main view. 
Now I want to look at this room in a panoramic. I just want to see it all flat. I don't want to see it in its round format. So I'm going to hit panoramic, and that will flatten this image out. So that is the same view in a flat format. There is nothing in this room that I can't see from this flat image. If I want to take this a step further and say give me the panoramic plus four panes, the top half is my panoramic and below are my images. Let me go ahead and put my viewfinder up here so you can see that this is looking at that. If I want to zoom in to this part, I just zoom this in tighter. And that's what I'm looking at right there. You can see the outline. So there's a tremendous amount of tools in here to look around, look back and forth. I can go back to the original donut if I want to. All right, let me take this back. Let me take it out of this mode. I'm going to go back to my... You also have a 180 degree. If, you, if, if you're putting this on the side of a building looking out, you don't want to look at the back half, you can put this in panoramic view if you want. But I'm going to go back to my main view. Now, the EPTZ, as I talked about earlier, it's one of my favorite features of this. Basically what I do when I turn that on is now I have the ability to go into this. Let me turn that back on. I have the ability to go into the image. I'm just going to drop it down closer or take it down to the, the floor. And then I'm going to look around this room. I'm just going to let it, I'm going to pull it up. And I'm going to look around the room. So you can see that I'm just scanning the room. I could be going very fast. I'm just letting it, since it's on the network, I don't want to make anybody dizzy here. But I'm looking down this corridor. I can zoom out that door. I can look back up and down that hallway. I can look around. All this is still being recorded. Anything behind me is still being recorded. I can zoom back up into my original view at the top level. So that EPTZ really gives me the ability to go in, look around, and see what's going on in the scene. Still giving me 100% coverage. And these are tools that are very, very easy to work and to use. All right, and this carries over not only in the live format, but this also carries over to playback. So if I go, before I go playback, let me go, let me show you one other thing. Let me show you the warehouse view wall mounted. So for those of you that might have an application where this would be mounted on the a wall instead of the ceiling looking down, uh, let's see, Warehouse 360, I'm pull that over. No, I'm going to pull Warehouse Wall 360. Okay, here this is mounted on the wall, looking back out at some of our uh, loading dock, or looking at our warehouse racking. This could be behind the teller, looking out, if there's ever an application where you want to look at multiple tellers, perhaps. Gavin, who's out here working, he's this is right above his door, so he just walked into his own his own door. I can turn this on for my EPTZ. Now I can zoom down these aisles, and I can look around. I can look all the way to the right, which is over in the shipping area. I can look all the way to the left and look at the loading docks. And then I can zoom back out. So that is the wall mount. I've never had a floor looking up. Not sure what that application would be, but it, it is possible to do that as well. And I can also go in and in a panoramic. It really, I could put in a panoramic view if I want, but I'm getting 100% coverage up, down, side to side, completely straight out. Now. In playback, this carries over. So this is nothing that you just have to play with in a live setting. Here I am in playback. I'm going to go back. There was some activity this morning. I'm going to go back and look uh, what went on. I'm going to push this and play. There was some, somebody was moving around in there. Maybe not then. Let's try this time. 
Oh, people are walking by here on the left and they're triggering motion. This is around the lunch hour, people going to lunch. Uh, this was in the dark. Okay, yeah, we've got a person in here, right here. I have access to the same tools that I had. I'm going to do this EPTZ, and I'm going to zoom in on this guy and take a closer look. Not sure what he's doing, but I'm going to push play. He's looking in the cabinets, and I can get a close look at him. I can pause it. I can play, zoom in, zoom out. So I have 100% ability to continue using all my tools, and that carries over into the clip copy. So once I hand this over to the police department or the HR or the FBI, they will have inside their player the same tools that you see right here. They will be able to go in and see this person, what he's doing, what he's doing moving around. We can fast forward him and see what he did. They walked out the hall, but I got him 100%. There's nothing that he did in this room that I didn't see, 100%. So IRAS is a training or an introduction all to itself. We could spend hours inside of here. There's, there's a lot of nice features inside IRAS. There is a webinar dedicated just to IRAS. But on the 360 side, I just wanted to demonstrate that quick test drive. And I want to move on and, and show a couple other, other features and how this actually configures into a system. So <clears throat> with that being said, um, if you have any questions about what you saw or would like to see in any more detail, just type those into the box for me, and I will uh, circle back around and make sure that I answer those. One other quick thing I might note is, um, on the live view, this 360 will even carry into the maps. I'm going to put a map up real quick of Uniselect. This is a warehouse of this company, Uniselect. I have a 360 camera right here. These I can have these pop up and give me a quick look at what's going on with this camera. So if I have an event over here that I need to take a closer look at, off of my map, I can double, double click this. <clears throat> and go in and look at what's going on in that area very quickly. So this does also tie to the maps and gives me all my features as well. And health checking. If I want to know if these are all healthy, I do have a health check tab, regardless of what camera or recorder of which of the CoStar recorders I have, I can look at this uh, health check as well and just make sure everything's healthy. All right, I'm going to close this down and Let's continue on. All right. <clears throat> what I want to make sure that everyone realizes and understands is that IRAS, what we just looked at, is our VMS to talk to any CoStar recorder, period, whether it's an analog, whether it's an XDI, whether it's an HD over coax, every single recorder that CoStar sells. So your customer, regardless of where they are in the cycle of technology, there is a product that they can go to and expand from. So all of these recorders are covered in IRAS. Up to 1,024 devices can be registered into IRAS. Now, in the recorder family, I want to make sure this is very clear, too. We have four product families. In the analog days, we had the E-Series. It's basically losing a lot of its popularity now just because of analog, which would be both of these products. Still very viable, very good products, but most people are going away from this type and going into either the HD over coax or to the XDI. The XDI series is what is using that 360 camera. So. Whenever you are looking for a recorder that will record this camera, it's in this series, the XDI, which is our enterprise level. It is an IP based with the ability to add accessories on, such as 360 cameras, encoders, decoders, all of those things. It is a 4, 8, 16, or 32 channel recorder, soon to have a 64 channel offering that's coming out in the first half of this year. It'll have a 64-channel server. All of those products will interface in with this product. 
And this is a 360. Just taking a closer look at some of the feature sets of this, it is a 5 megapixel like we mentioned earlier. It is IP66, regardless of whether you use it inside or outside. It just It's sealed up. It's in a, a metal chassis, so it helps with heat dissipation. There's a lot of processing going on inside this camera. You can pendant mount it, wall mount it, either with hardware or just directly onto the ceiling. And it uses our direct IP interface. What that means to anyone who's installers, that means you plug it in, it finds itself, and you push accept, and it's registered. It also means that I don't have to get IP addresses from the IT department. I just plug this in. It stays on its own separate network records and then I have one connection to the outside world for all my WAN connections. Just keeps everything simple. We'll look at the back of it here in just a second. Now for those of you that aren't familiar with the XDI, there's basically five key components of an XDI series. That's what makes this very easy as a salesperson to configure. All you have to do is pick your recorder, 4, 8, 16, 32. Now the four channel unfortunately does not accommodate the oh, the 360 camera will work on there but it takes two licenses per recorder so just want to, let me let me make that clear is when you plug in a 360 camera into a costar recorder the 4 the 8 or the 16 it will take two licenses for every one 360 camera that you put on there that means you can have a maximum of eight on a 16 channel recorder. And it's not a, a ploy to get you to buy more cameras or more recorders. It has to do with the processing of the recorder. We can't overload the recorder with the 360 cameras. It just, the processing can't handle that much information. So it is reduced down. In a 32 channel, it takes four licenses per. In that scenario, you can still put eight IP cameras or eight 360 cameras on a 32 channel. However, if you're just adding one, which is usually the case, one or two, it would take four eight off of a 32 channel, and then it would leave you with 24 additional channels to put IP cameras on. So on the spec sheet it, it, off the website, it will detail that out. So just keep that in mind. The second component is if you need more than 36 terabytes inside the main body recorder, you can add these extended storage devices. I can add four of these, which have 24 terabytes in each. I can get upwards of 130 plus terabytes inside a complete system. I also have expanders, so I can take this expander, put it on the other side of the building and run cameras to it with only one feed back to the recorder. So these switches or expanders are IP compatible. They're just plug and play. They do give me diagnostics back to the recorder. So if I want to know throughout the entire system what port, what camera is plugged into, how much power it's drawing, how much data is being pulled across, this this combination will give me all of those stats. Then I have my camera selection, 360s, bullets, PTZs, whatever your option you're looking for, it's likely offered. And finally is an encoder. If you do have an element of analog inside your system, you can continue using it. You add this encoder. They're not very expensive, $50 a channel maybe, max. You can put that encoder in, plug in your analog, and it will record into your, your recorder. And the nice thing about using the encoder is if I do have analog and that analog dies and I want to put IP back in, as soon as I unplug the analog from this box, I get the channel back in my recorder as an IP channel. So unlike a built-in hybrid where I have BNCs and everything built in, I don't get those channels back necessarily. In this scenario, I would. Okay, let's go into the final, um, the final layout right here and look at how this is laid out inside of a system. 
And I did have a question here I want to address real quick before I jump into this part is that there was a question about the 360 camera, whether it was one or multiple lenses. And it is, the answer to that is it is a single lens. So it is a true one, it's a 1.4 millimeter lens, which gives me that extreme view. And it is warped into just one. We're not, this is not a multi-head camera. Okay. When configuring the system, just like we talked about earlier, only thing I need is the XDI. So in this case, there's eight ports here, but let's call this the 16 channel. So imagine, if you will, 16 channel ports back here. I can have cameras plugged directly into these ports. So here I have these cameras. I have one channel, two channels, two channels. So there's four channels taken off the back of this, this recorder right here. If I want to use an encoder, let's say I've got three more cameras. Each one of these is only going to take one apiece. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of my 16. And then I've got a long run with cameras way on the other side of the building. So I'm going to run this switch out there. And I'm going to connect another camera with another 360. So now I have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This scenario right here takes 10 of my 16, <clears throat> all running at you know 5 megapixel to 2 megapixel. And icing on the cake is I only need one IP address from the network administrator, which was likely the one that we took off the recorder that we're replacing. So it's not going to upset the IT scheme or infrastructure. Just give us the one WAN ac access. IP and all these cameras stream on their own network side. They will not affect the customer's network whatsoever. So that gives you a layout, just kind of a rough overview of how this lays out, how easily this lays out, and it's tried and true. This has been a very good platform for um, your a level technicians as well as your B and C level technicians. You don't have to have a Microsoft certification to be able to install this technology. Okay, well, this is, there was a question about the expander, <clears throat> um, explaining that expander. I'll just jump back up here since it's just one slide above. What this expander does is it is, a, it's simply a PoE switch is what this is. It is a simple switch that we offer four models of in the case of a 32-channel recorder. We only have the density on the back of that recorder for 16 IP ports. So you have to go and add a 16 more ports in order to get all the inputs you need. These expanders, they come in a, see an 8-channel, 16, 24, and with and without fiber module connection. So these two that we're looking at right here have SFP module inputs, so I can run fiber into these if I want. I also have a offering without fiber, so there's four total. The, the special thing about these switches, and it's we don't charge a, an arm and a leg for the switches, so it's not just the, a ploy to sell switches. It does offer bi-directional communication between the recorder itself, the switch, and the camera. For example, I can open up on the front of the box a diagnostic tool that will tell me what camera number is plugged into which port number throughout the entire network. And it will tell me how much power I'm drawing and if I have any issues. So the diagnostic piece of this is very, is, is very uh, powerful. You can use any switch you want. You can use whatever you like, PoE or non-PoE, doesn't matter, but you just lose that link of communication. So the, that is what the expander does. And you just match it up, like I said, a four, let me see, an eight channel, 16 channel, 24 channel, and various wattages on that. If you're using PTZs, you, perhaps you want to go with the 24 because it gives you, gosh, four to 600 watts of power, I don't recall exactly, but it, it does give you a lot of wattage output. So you just want to keep that in mind. So hopefully that answered your question about the, um, the expander. 
I'm going to put my contact information up here. Is, is if anyone has questions, now is the time as we start to wrap this up. Um, try to make this as efficient as possible. If you have questions, I'll stay on here as long as you have questions. I appreciate you taking the time today to, to set through this very quickly. We welcome the opportunity to demo this to you, to your sales guys, to anybody that is interested, end users included. Be happy to do this demonstration as well. We run this about once every couple weeks. We'll do a new topic, sometimes once a week. But if you have a topic that you're particularly interested in, you can email me at this address, mikear at costarvideo.com. Be happy to uh, to take that into consideration and, and write some content around it. But on our website, you will find what webinars we have. You'll find our video library as well as our white paper library and a whole bunch of calculators for uh, power calculations, mount configurators, days of storage, all those types of tools are found out at our CoStarVideo.com website. So, all right, well, I will remain on the line. We're going to wrap up now. If there's any other questions, feel free to, to send those across. I'd be happy to uh, answer them. If not, then uh, <clears throat> feel free to, to sign out. And uh, there is a survey at the end of this, if you don't mind taking a couple minutes and just letting us know how we did and if there's anything we can improve on, be happy to, to do that. All right. Well, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it.